Welcome to Inside Analog Photo. I'm your host, Scott Shepard, and the Inside Analog Photography radio program is brought to you by Fujifilm, making life more colorful. You know, they got great pack film, three and a quarter by four and a quarter, four by five, and the brand new Instax film is here and the new cameras. Great stuff going on with Fuji and, of course, excellent chrome. Excellent negative C41, excellent black and white. Just a lot of great stuff going on with Fuji paper. You name it, check it out. www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional. Our friends over at Richard Photo Lab for a great place to send all of your development needs, either be black and white, chrome, C41 neg, digital files, anything need done, these guys can help you out. Great work with Richard Photo Lab at richardphotolab.com. Our friends over at Upstrap, over at Upstrap-Pro.com. A great camera strap will not let the camera slide off your shoulder. I use one every day on every one of my bodies. A lot of other people do. It's great stuff. It will not come off. Cool product. And, of course, our media partners at the Analog Photography User Group over at www.apug.org. The place on the net to find out about everything about the traditional photographic process. Today, we got a great guest we have with us, Scott DiSabato. Scott is the Marketing Manager, Professional Film with Eastman Kodak. And of course, we're going to talk about the brand new Ektar 100 C41 negative color print film. Hey, Scott, how you doing today? I'm doing great, Scott. And yourself? Excellent. Thanks for joining us here on Inside Analog Photo. I really appreciate you taking some time to talk about the brand new Ektar 100 film and everything else that's going on with Kodak. So, Scott, tell us here, you guys have just announced a brand new C41 color negative film at Photokina. Let's talk about this new Ektar 100. That's right. So it's Kodak Professional Ektar 100 film. I think a lot of people out there listening might remember the name Ektar, and that has a long history within Kodak. It applied to a range of lenses we had that were incredibly sharp and had great resolving power. In the 80s and 90s, we had some films that were introduced with the Ektar name that, at that point in time, were some of the first color negative emulsions to have T-grain in it. And the green to speed ratio of those films were phenomenal for the time, and they also produce great image structure. So now sort of drafting behind the old Ektar 25 film that we had, we're introducing the Ektar 100 film. Essentially what we've done is we're using vision technology that we borrowed from our motion picture group. They have been using this technology for the past several years with some of their films to produce just incredible image structure. So the technology essentially borrows all the goodness that we can get from the T-grain emulsions and also marries that up with some of Kodak's advanced cubic emulsions, kind of the old traditional silver halide emulsion structure, and sort of blends those two in an optimal way to get just the very best image structure possible with the technology we have today. So I guess talking about the grain structure, this would be actually T-grain with the cubic emulsion sort of mixed in between. So I guess it would fill in where the T-grain doesn't touch. So it sort of gives you this combination of a T-grain and a cubic grain. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking of it sort of like brick and mortar. Right. You've got larger efficient grains that do a terrific job of capturing light. But when properly exposed and all the emulsions are sensitized properly, you then get that very fine grain associated with the advanced cubic emulsions that we have to produce just amazing image structures. The print grain index on this film is 25. So that makes it actually the world's finest grain color negative film that has been produced. So we're quite proud of that. Wow. And so a lot of this has to come with the advances in the vision technology because I don't know if people realize that most motion pictures are still shot on film. Yeah, for sure. The motion picture group continues to do very, very well. The camera films that they make, I think you can almost see it in cinematography that you can tell in decades ago that there were some pretty massive lights that were lighting the set. But truly now you see a lot of filmmakers are using existing light and it just creates such a wonderful mood. So the improvement in either speed sensitivity with adequate image structure or more on the end that we borrowed for this film, just the absolute best in image structure with a decent amount of light. It's amazing. So there continues to be some nice research and development in that segment of filmmaking. So we very gratefully borrowed some of the technology they had on the shelf and made the new Ektar 100 film. So we're definitely going to see probably a better print, a better negative, a better scan out of the Ektar 100 than we would have ever seen from the Ektar 25. Yeah, you know, the Ektar 25, although it reached kind of a benchmark in terms of its image quality, it came with a little bit of baggage. 
the film was quite contrasty for a color negative film, you really ended up having to expose it a heck of a lot more like a slide film with very little over or under exposure latitude. What we've done with the Ektar 100 is knowing that this is going to be scanned in most every case, we really brought the contrast down with this film to just a, a normal kind of moderate level. So we have our kind of shadow detail and highlight detail values closer together so that when you're scanning it, you can easily capture all the important detail that you have. But we've also built in with this emulsion and the contrast level some wonderful under and over exposure. You can definitely get a one stop under exposure latitude out of this film and two stops over exposure latitude. You know, that's one of the beautiful things about color negative film is that elasticity it has in exposure, that latitude that still captures that information and just sort of leaves you with the confidence after shooting all day that you've got that image there. If it's slightly off, the film can very easily grab what you need to bring it out in a scan or bring it out in optical print if you choose to do that. But we fully expect that the image structure improvements here will just one for one translate into a scanning environment. Yeah, definitely. I think you're so true with that one. I think people might ask about, okay, well, we have this new Ektar 100. It's got this great color. It pops, all this great saturation and contrast, vivid color. What does this mean with the Ultra Color Series 100 and 400 films? I think the Ektar might be replacing some of the older Ultra Color emulsions. How is this working out? Yeah, you're right, Scott. If we look at what the Ultra Color films were created to do, the Ektar 100 does all of those things just a little bit better. So without any apologies, you know, I think moving a customer that was looking for high-impact, incredible image structure, and just that general kind of pop and saturation you're looking for, I think Ultra Color 100 customers will be very, very pleased with the Ektar 100. Now, in the past two years, we've made actually two revisions to the Portra 400 series. So the Portra 400 VC film is going to replace the Ultra Color 400 film. And again, the improvements we have made in the color, in the image structure, again, I think that the move from the 400 over to the Portra 400 Vivid Color will be seamless as well. So it allows us to take two films out of the portfolio and introduce two films to photographers that offer a little bit newer technology for them and I think some things that they can embrace. Scott, who's the Ektar 100 really geared towards? Is this for commercial people? People doing travel, outdoor, fashion, still life, product, portrait. Who is this really geared at? Well, you know, I hate to pigeonhole that type of photographer that might want to use any film because that can be the beauty of film is experimenting and getting different results and different palettes from different films. But for sure, I think a travel, nature, outdoor photographer is going to benefit from this film. It has great image structure. It has a high saturation and that exposure latitude that you'll be able to use, I think it will help for sure. However, just anybody looking for those characteristics that some of them that we've reviewed where you want that image structure, maybe you're working with roll formats, but you have the desire to enlarge tremendously or get a really high-end drum scan or Imacon scan or something and just have an amazing file to work with. If you want color, if you want great, strong, bold color without trading off any of that tonal information, that can happen sometimes when high color films start to lay down the die. I think this will be a great film. So, you know, I could see people using it for street shooting, fine art, but definitely I think for travel nature, this will be a great film. Commercial photographers that are looking for those things and prefer to use film, I think can get a lot of mileage out of this as well. So I'd really like anyone that kind of has a passion for high color or image structure to think about this film could end up in their camera bag. So I think that that kind of covers a list of possibilities, but we'll have to see. Yeah, and I think some of the stuff that's been showing up because, you know, you guys have been giving out samples at Photokina and, of course, at Photo Plus a few weeks back in New York City. I think the film is in stock with a lot of the retailers, so it's actually showing up and people are putting their sample photos up online. And there's a little Flickr group already going for Ektar 100. And the results have been pretty impressive so far, that at least you don't know the quality of what's being shown up mm -hmm. on Flickr and so forth. But the stuff's pretty cool. It definitely has a pop to it. Yeah, I've seen some of the Flickr imagery up there, and it's great. Some of the stuff that I enjoy looking at, and the film is definitely pleasing. And it's great to hear then that the people that have scanners at home or were getting it done at a lab 
are finding the, the film scans well, because that was really a project goal with this film. But to see the results, and I'm also loving the comments for them to post the files so that people can really dig into it and see what the film's all about. I think that's exciting. But yeah, the film looks good, and it started shipping towards the middle, end of October, so it's out there and available. Photographers can go to our website, and they may actually have to pull down the catalog number and maybe ask their local professional dealer to order it for them, just because this is a brand new film that doesn't have a predecessor necessarily. So in some cases, the dealers might just be finding out about this as well. You can find it, and most places are going to have it here soon enough. Yeah. Rattle the cage enough, it will show up at your local store. Or just buy it in bulk from one of the online retailers or your lab. I mean, that's another thing, too, is people that are Kodak professional labs, I think, are going to have this emulsion to stock in-house. So if you're actually working with a lab, it's probably a good place to check with to start with. Yeah, and I would just say that any place a photographer is currently getting their film, when it's convenient for them, that they will be able to order the film or find it directly or through a distributor, for sure. Let's talk about how this would affect or have an impact, Scott, on maybe people shooting chrome because if the claim that Kodak is saying this is the finest grain film ever made, if you guys put that on the box, I'm sure Kodak Legal yeah. ran this through the ringer to be able yeah. to make this claim. Well, how would this relate to people that are shooting chrome? Because I know anymore E6 chemistry is sort of touchy unless you're doing it yourself and you're sort of really into the whole darkroom gig yourself. Sometimes it can be a little difficult to find a really good E6 lab in some farther reaching out spots of the country. It's yeah. great if you're in San Francisco, New York, Los Angeles, blah, blah, blah. Great. But sometimes, you know, maybe I might want to shoot something besides Chrome because it's a hassle to get done unless I mail it off. How is this compared to maybe shooting Ektachrome or some other type of Chrome-based yeah. reversal film? Yeah, great question, Scott. Really, I kind of break it up into two pieces. The claim that we have is a world's finest grain color negative film. But to your point, it's sometimes hard to compare print grain index which the color neg films are measured by, and RMS granularity, which the chrome films are measured by. But we did some very, very high-end scans shot with the Ektar 100 film, our E100G film, which is Kodak's finest grain transparency film, and also one competitive film. We shot the same subject, did high-res scan, enlarged it several thousand percent, studied the dye cloud patterns on all three images, and it looks like the Ektar 100 has potentially a slight edge among the two other transparency films there. So I'm not sure where that goes, but I think everybody that is shooting chrome for the color and image structure won't really be giving anything up if they were to make the move over to the Ektar 100. And obviously, looking at a chrome on a light box is its own reward just because the color gamut is just so incredible. But for anyone that ultimately is working in that hybrid environment, this has a lot of other benefits being a color negative film. But to your question around processing, for sure, there are challenges with finding E6 processing and good E6 processing. That's an important part to consider because with E6, the film is your final product, so it has to be done very well. And there are some great labs out there, and we expect them to continue on. But for people that are suddenly inconvenienced by not having that lab down the road anymore, and they still like to use film, maybe their client base is fine working with film, I think reaching for a roll of the Ektar 100 and scanning it as most chrome film ultimately gets scanned is a real possibility to replace either a, a mild or high color chrome film with very high image quality. I think this certainly has the potential to provide a safety net for photographers that want beautiful film but convenient. Exactly. Like you said, E6 is great. There's nothing like looking at some chrome on his light table, but it is touchy with the chemistry and a lot of labs that don't do E6 as much as they used to, just because of our little friend, Mr. Digital, has sort of put a damper on some of the E6 laboratories and a lot of guys closing down and keeping their chemistry up. So like I said, I think this yeah. is great. And you can actually take this type of film, a C41 process. I mean, it's really hard to kill it and you have to be really dumb to step on this one that bad. So you could take it to any corner drugstore and get this stuff processed. Yeah, you're right, and we talked a lot about exposure latitude already, but color neg film, to a degree, has processing latitude where it can be good to great, and the image quality is going to be pretty much the same. Yeah, I still think people should go buy a case of chrome, though, and shoot it and learn how to do correct exposures because this teaches you how to be a good photographer when you have such a narrow exposure latitude like a piece of chrome reversal oh. film, and I think people should actually learn how to do photography on chrome, and then once you're there... 
then you can go ahead and step into some C41 and have a little bit of latitude. But the problem today is people start off, they've never shot film. They're shooting digital. They don't know how to do exposures. They're relying on some kind of raw file from a digital camera. You know, digital is fun and great and all that. But really, to be able to be a real photographer, you need to go out and shoot Chrome, I think, and learn how to do exposures. There's still something with shooting Chrome. I don't know. Yeah, all films and digital are tools. But yeah, in terms of cutting your teeth and learning, Chrome film reveals very quickly what you've just done, for good or worse. Like I was saying earlier, there's nothing finer to look at than a well-exposed Chrome. And the beauty, too, is it, it's not open for interpretation. If you were shooting in warm light, sometimes the color negative system or digital white balance will try to correct that by adding cooler colors in there. But Chrome takes into consideration the exposure you gave it, the quality of the light that was there, and there's no doubt about it. It really helps you connect with your equipment and the way you meter. I agree. I think it's a fantastic way to start. And It's been interesting, Scott. I get to work a lot of trade shows, and I've had photographers, just judging by their age or number of years, shooting as a photographer, I would guess maybe never really worked with film, and they've maybe started out with digital. They hear things about film that the essence and a lot of the intangibles and the green structure and the look and the feel. Over the past couple of years, I've had photographers that were 100% digital forever come to me, and I sent them away with a couple rolls of film so that they could experience what is the foundation for a lot of the terminology and a lot of the technique so they feel that they've experienced more. And a lot of the things that people are trying to replicate with digital, especially like black and white grain and that, I know a pretty easy way to do that is to shoot film in the first place. But I think every photographer has that choice of tools in front of them. And it's just been great to see. And we have some research over the past couple of years that sort of bears it out that professional photographers, even though about 90% of them use digital very regularly, they will still use film. More than half of professional photographers out there still use some film, maybe for personal work or for fine art or for documentary projects that they're working on or a specific client that prefers the handoff of film and all the information that's contained there. But it's great to see. And as a result, Kodak is able to build a sustainable film business around what we call internally the and world. It's digital and film, and that's great. It allows us to introduce films like Ektar 100. We invested in this film, and we would only do that if we expected to see a return on this film over the next several years. And in fact, we've had a great couple of years stretch here, Scott. Last year at Photo Plus, we introduced our T-Max 400 film, and that's the world's finest grain, sharpest 400-speed black and white film. And that is just an absolutely superb film. Back in 2006, 2007, we revamped the entire portrait lineup of five different films. So we are continuing to invest in areas where we expect photographers will continue to use those types of films for the foreseeable future. Oh, definitely. And I think that people are coming around to the film stuff that have always shot digital, people that have never shot film. I think they have a deal now where it's like they're in the computer all day, every day at work, at home, doing this, doing that. And people want to go out and do a craft. They want to actually shoot film because they don't want to be in front of the computer. Yeah, I mean, I'm seeing it, and I always try to temper my view of the world and my enthusiasm because I I think people probably seek me out to tell me these sort of stories, but there's no doubt. I think photographers that understand the value of their time, that most of them are making money when they're clicking the shutter, that's what a photographer does, and that's hopefully where most photographers are getting paid. You can, as a film photographer, do a lot of clicks, and hopefully that's bringing in money where a lot of the post-production work or pre-production, however you want to view it in front of the computer there, that may be saving you money, but it's not necessarily making you money unless the client was offering that up as an added service they expected of you and and paying for that. So as a photographer understands the value of their time, I think film makes a little bit more sense because labs are just incredible today. Whether they receive a digital file or a piece of film that they scan, they'll be delivering back to you pretty much and exactly what you want. And if they can do that for you and you can continue to do other things in your business and marketing, promote, and hopefully photograph, that's a great thing. So, you know, I hear it from wedding photographers that have come back to film. But you're right. There are other intangible or kind of visual elements to film that are preferred. 
the skin tone sometimes I hear and the highlight and gradations and tonality and the color just being right in the photographic system. And then when there is grain in a film, I think photographers have been able to use that as being real and of substance. So very interesting. It's kind of fascinating. And I think a lot of professionals felt they had to be shooting digital to be relevant in some ways. I think the novelty of that for being digital just for digital sake has maybe run its course. And then we're kind of back to what I was starting to say earlier that this film and all the films out there are just another choice that photographers have to meet their final product need or client need or whatever it may be. So it's an exciting time. It is. And, and touching base on what you had said about Kodak introducing the T-Max 400 last year at Photo Plus, has the new T-Max been recepted by the photographic community? Yeah, I know it's been out there now for about a year. How's things going with the whole black and white gig? Yeah, I can cut that up a couple of different ways. The T-Max 400 film alone, just that product, the sales are actually up versus 2007. So that tells me right away that the product that we created attracted some new customers and photographers that wanted to use this as an alternative to perhaps what they were using before. So there's a great good news story there. However, I think the whole black and white segment has either benefited from this introduction or just black and white is doing very well because our sales are very, very competitive with where we were a year ago. So I think that's fantastic news. In 35 millimeter, I'm seeing great sales versus 2007. And the interesting thing is that I think the loyalty towards film is greater as you go up in format size. So medium format is doing quite well and large format, kind of the same thing. So black and white is certainly the area of film photography that is definitely the most tenacious. And that's great to see. But if we break it down to some of the things we've talked about just in this call, Scott, the whole fine art association, the whole documentary type of work that has continued to be somewhat film-based, I could see both of those types of photographers using quite a bit or maybe just a little bit of black and white film for those sort of projects. But it's also, I think, it's the tangibility of the medium. Film is something you can look at and hold, and you put it in a larger, and you expose a piece of paper with it and get your hands on it in the darkroom, and that's great. And then lately, there has been certainly a strong emphasis in a hybrid workflow where that piece of film gets scanned. They look at different alternatives for printing and output ranging from inkjet to sea prints that are neutralized or desaturated. So it's a very interesting time in black and white, and the students I get to talk to at these shows show no sign of letting up on working with black and white products. So good stuff. Great to see that everything is evolving there. I guess we should probably touch on that everybody always asks about is Kodachrome. Kodak is still producing Kodachrome. You can still get it processed at Duane's in Kansas. I guess everything is just staying where it's at and going forward. You hit it, Scott. We're still producing Kodachrome. Obviously, I think just having one lab worldwide has impacted and affected the convenience of that film emulsion to photographers that wish to use it. We're still producing it, and the sales are not nearly as strong as what we see with our Ektachrome line, just a small fraction of what Kodachrome was in its heyday. But there's still a system out there. We make Professional 64 and Consumer 64. Dwayne's photo in Parsons, Kansas is still processing K-14. So it's there. Buy it. Uh, Maybe one question that people always ask about is what's the difference between the consumer and the professional K-64? Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of things associated with the uh, two different emulsions. I guess the tolerance associated with the professional spec is much tighter. So speed and the color balance are exactly what they need to be for exposure. And then if you refrigerate that film, the dye is aged at a slower rate, and you can grab it out of the refrigerator, let it warm up, expose it, and pretty much know what you're going to get. On the consumer side, we actually have to build in a bias because it's not being stored in refrigeration. So the dye aging is accelerated, so we build in a bias not only for while it's sitting on the shelves, but when it's sitting in the camera to the time it actually gets processed. So the best analogy out there would be the green banana. If you're buying groceries for a week, you may buy slightly green bananas, knowing that over the next couple of days it's going to age, it'll become a less green banana, a nice yellow banana, and then some brown spots will appear as the sugar increases and then it gets very brown and and then you throw them away. 
So it's it's sort of biasing it, knowing that it's going to age, is really what we do with the consumer emulsion. But the analogy for the pro film is it's that nice yellow, maybe just barely starting to show some brown signs, or however you like it. That banana has sugar, it's yellow, and maybe with a little bit of brown, just the way you like it. You can peel that banana right there and eat it, and you have a professional banana. Yeah, definitely a cool way to put that so people know the difference between the two, because Sometimes people that are getting into this stuff and they hear about Kodachrome and they're like, wow, there's this all this legend behind it. I want to go shoot some. And then they're like, well, well, which one do I buy? Well, of course you want to get the professional because tighter specs, better refrigeration, things are just a little bit more tighter around the whole pro line of film. So I think it's something you want to look at when you're buying any kind of film. Yeah, but I would also add to that, especially if someone's just kicking the tires on it and they want to get a feel for it. It depends what your subject matter is. If you're in a studio and under controlled lighting, I think you'll clearly see the benefits of a professional emulsion. If you plan to photograph with this film for the next several weeks and you're not necessarily going to just blast through it in one outing and you're going to shoot in a range of different lighting conditions, it's hard to say. You know, maybe the consumer emulsion will work out just fine too because you'll be in open shade and warm sunsets and just straight noon daylight stuff. So, you know, who knows? With the color balance under the conditions you're photographing will probably vary more than the film's bias would. So just something to think about. But yeah, what a neat, unique film that really starts out as a black and white film. And the color actually is added in the processing, in the K14 process, where the ectochromes have the dyes in the film itself that are brought out during development. So a very different technology. It's just something I think people should play with if they've never actually played with any Kodachrome is actually shoot some and experience it. It's just really cool. Yeah, I agree. What can you say, you know? Yeah. One last thing I want to touch on here, Scott, is how the reception of the Portra 400 VC has been. This was also announced at Photo Plus last year. I think we had spoken to Yvette Roman, that's one of your professional-based shooters that's using the Portra line in her wedding and portrait business. How's things going with the whole Portra line itself? Yeah, the launch this year was just a really easy to implement revision that allowed us to improve the grain yet again. It wasn't nearly as big as the product change that we made from Portra version 1.0 to the brand new stuff that had multiple changes and really was a completely new emulsion where I would say this was a tweak that just gave us just a little bit sweeter grain than we had before, which is important in the 400 speed films because they kind of get pushed to their limits in portraiture, weddings, and location work that they're used on. So, yeah, the reception's been really good. The improvement in grain has been noticed. And, again, that's what we're striving for is to make sure that that film in a hybrid workflow is keeping up. And when we have technology that we can put into these films to improve the results, we'll continue to do that. So, yeah, it's gone well, and nice to see some groups of photographers like you that that are very loyal to using film. Even though they're very comfortable with digital, there are a lot of things that they much prefer over film, and any chance they have a chance to make the choice themselves, they've been using film. Yeah, I think it's just a great time to be shooting film, to be able to capture on a great analog emulsion. Like you said, most people are into a hybrid workflow, even professional labs. They'll develop the stuff in multiple fashions, but then it's all scanned. And then sent back to a customer, maybe it's modified slightly if there's any kind of adjustments, and then sent back to a lab, digitally printed on an analog process paper through a digital exposure. Yeah, I think it's a great time to be able to play with film itself and still be able to use these newer technologies to enhance your workflow and just have fun with the stuff. The original raw file, if you will. You can go back and scan differently or scan with a highlight or shadow bias. And the wonderful thing is in 10 or 15 years, you can feel pretty comfortable that you could probably go back and do that exact same thing. It's neat to talk to people that are going back and revisiting some of their early work that maybe at at that point in time wasn't important to them or wasn't where their style was heading. It's great to see them being able to go back into the 60s and 70s and look at some old work with a new appreciation go back, scan it, and you're not locked into a piece of technology that is limiting. I know some of the early cameras that I worked with at Kodak were one megapixel, so, and that was a professional camera back in like 92. Great when you have the immediate need and you need immediate access to the image, but wow, pretty cool to be able to go back to the mid-60s and find a piece of Tri-X film and scan it, and you pretty much have that look and feel that you can get today, so neat stuff and it's great to be able to go back into your work and make it relevant today 
It is, and I think that's the big thing with film, is you do have this original raw file, this original capture, and technology is changing very fast. I mean, look what you can do now with your in-studio software with scanning. Like you said, well, do I want to scan it for the highlights? Do I want to scan it for the shadows? Well, now you can scan stuff in HDR, and you can make multiple pass scans to get all this information and pull many stops more of information out of a piece of film than you could have even a couple years ago. The same gear, so the software is advancing. So that's what's great, I think, about capturing on film is you have this recorded image that you clicked in time. You've captured time on a piece of plastic, and now you can come back, like you said, 5, 10, 15, even 20 years later, Mm -hmm. 100 years and scan it with newer technology and actually pull more information out of it. And you have something that's there, and we don't know that these digital files, I mean, look how the evolution of the digital camera has been, and even the computer itself. And can I read files right now that I wrote on my Apple II in 1976? Not really. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, well, I mean, what's going to happen with digital files? Yeah, I mean, I don't really want to slam digital because it can be pretty awesome. Oh, no, it's great uh, technology. And, and- but you're absolutely right. And file formats and media types, the archivalness of the media, those will all be questions that will become more and more important as photographers build up a giant body of work and hopefully they're preserving it with kind of redundant backups that they can continue to access and update those files. But yeah, it's nice. And the other thing that you hear once in a while too is that film gets thrown out less too. So you do have that opportunity to go back many years or several decades later on. You were less likely to toss it, and you'll be able to read that analog file first with your eye, and then as you really want to get into that and do something with it with a film scanner. Maybe one thing we could touch on real quick, Scott, is you know people that aren't really used to using film that are starting to shoot more film, and they want to be able to archive this stuff. What is a good way that someone needs to store their negative? So when they do have this great caption, they do want to keep it around for 20, 30 years. I mean, they used to put this stuff in like little vellum envelopes and they put them in plastic sleeves now. There's different ways to store it. What is just a good way that someone want to keep their film in a nice, happy environment so they can look at it 20 years from now? Yeah, I think the first step and the most important thing is to make sure it was properly developed, processed, and washed so that the fixer did its thing and the final wash sort of extracted all the remnants of chemicals in the emulsion to the best of our ability. From there, you typically would store a film in a non-vinyl PVC environment in a sleeve that is made for archiving. You have to watch with some papers because they may have traces of acid in there that will attack and degrade the photographic emulsion over time. So in terms of sleeving or putting them into file holders, definitely go with an archival. I guess the rule of thumb is if, if the plastic smells, don't put your film in it because that's releasing gases that will, over time, attack the film, especially the color emulsions. The next thing to think about is temperature. Dyes age in a number of ways. One of them is its thermal properties. Just the heat creates activity with the dyes, so you want to store it in a kind of a, a cool environment. I even know photographers that have what they would consider priceless images to them that will store these in a freezer. But I'll get to a point about that in a second. So just like film before it's processed, you can slow down the aging of dyes that have been developed by keeping it under controlled conditions, keeping away from excessive heat. And obviously the other consideration then is light. Make sure that the film is not being subjected to light. So keeping it in a dark, cool place with low humidity is probably the best way to store these type of images. So watch the attic, watch the basement really kind of keep it in an environment that you as a person would be comfortable with. The point I was making about freezing film, there are cases, I remember this is film emulsion, and it has a tendency in high humidity or high moisture conditions to soak up and pick up the atmospheric moisture. If you do that in a high humidity environment and then were to put it in a freezer, there is the possibility with some emulsions, with some conditions, that moisture could actually freeze and impact some of the dye structure. It could cause some crazing in that. So it's hard to say when that happens, but just something to think about. Maybe if you did it in Nevada or Arizona, where there's low humidity and threw it in the freezer, you wouldn't have that moisture in the emulsion to be concerned with. But perhaps in Florida or Louisiana, you may have an issue there. So just something to think about. But those are kind of the basic things you need to monitor and control to make sure that your images have a nice, long, useful life. 
I guess just one last thing that has an impact. It's just atmospheric pollution. Those can get into the film. They're not properly stored and attack and erode the dyes at a much faster rate. So those are pretty much the variables you've got to contend with. You just need to be smart about what you're doing. Just think, well, you know, do I want to be in this environment? Same yeah, way with that. Yeah, exactly. Scott, let's talk about availability of Ektar 100, the other Kodak professional products. Where's a good place to look? Resources on the web. Looking for a lab if I want to have a lab do some stuff. And of course, I know we go to Dwayne's with our Kodachrome. But let's talk about, A, availability of the film, and secondary, where do I get this stuff developed and worked on? Yeah, availability of the film, as we mentioned a little earlier, we started shipping in October. So the product is now shipping from our distribution centers. So any Kodak professional stockhouse dealer, as we call them, has access to this product. And likewise, any professional lab that we do business with would have the ability to order the Ektar 100. And that's a great number of, of customers out there when it's all said and done. We also have distributors that serve other dealers that may not be direct with us. The product is definitely available. And that's why I'm thinking if you really want to try some of this film and your local dealer doesn't have it yet, just let them know that we are making it. It is available. Could you please order some? Hopefully that individual photographer won't be alone with the demand of this pretty fantastic film. All of our information, Kodak used to print and publish a whole lot of things. But it just makes a heck of a lot more sense now to put all this rich technical information on our website. So I would point everybody to www.kodak.com slash go slash professional. And from there, you can get a whole range of information about professional films, chemistry, paper, and any other items that may interest you. As you sort of dig down and click down into the website, in almost every case, there will be a technical publication that you can download in PDF form and view that either soft on your screen or print that out if you need it. So with the black and white films that would have the development times and characteristic curves and all the technical information associated with the color films. So that's a great place to go. We also have a ProLab locator. And as we talked about earlier, some of the challenges we have is marrying up photographers' desires for certain products like our color metallic paper or E6 processing or C41 with the lab that offers it. So our ProLab locator really offers a listing of services based upon the town and state that a photographer may be in. It's also very good for a photographer that may be traveling to an area and wishes to get their film processed or get some other lab work done while they're visiting. Basically, you just type in your city and your state. I think zip code as well will work. Say you're looking for E6 processing, it will give you a list of the closest several labs that offer that service, and that can be accessed from our professional website as well. Scott, other resources you had, this ProPass program for professional photographers. Maybe we can touch on this real quick. Sure, yeah. We are still publishing that, if you will, every month. And every other month is what we call a U.S. edition, so it is aimed squarely at the U.S. marketplace. And then every other edition has more of an international flair to it, which is always, I think, fascinating. And I think it's wonderful to see what other parts of the world may be doing photographically and may be kind of aspirational to you to kind of see what's going on there. So you can definitely sign up in the professional area for our ProPass program and receive information on kind of the latest product introductions. But probably more than that, I think it's the stories that we do on professional photographers that I find to be very interesting, and that's really what I like to read when I see that. But we'll pepper it in very lightly with new product introductions and things, just so you're aware of what Kodak's been up to. Yeah, there's a lot of great info there. And like you said, it's cool to read about what other photographers are doing because I think that's a lot of things that other photographers want to see is, well, what's this guy doing? What's this girl doing? What's going on? What are they doing? What kind of image are they creating? And it sort of gives other photographers a more creative spark to get going and maybe try something else. Or, you know, just play around. So it's great to be able to read what other people are doing and using this type of product. So it's pretty cool. For sure, yeah. Scott, I really appreciate you joining us today talking about the new Ektar 100, what's been going on with Kodak and the film and all the resources that are available. And just be able to talk to you guys and see what's going on with Kodak and uh, experience this new film and the great stuff going on. Well, Scott, it's been my pleasure. I love to be able to work with you and your audience that share the passion I have for film and the uh, whole traditional process. So can't wait to come back again. There you go, Scott. Thanks so much, buddy. All right. Well, there you go. Scott DiSabato, marketing manager for Eastman Kodak in the professional film division. And of course, we've been talking about Ektar 100 and all the other stuff going on with 
Kodak. I've been your host, Scott Shepard, here on Inside Analog Photo. And of course, the Inside Analog Photography Radio Show is brought to you by our great friends over at Fujifilm. Check them out over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional. You know, they got some great product, a lot of new stuff, a lot of cool stuff going on with Fuji. Fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional, making life more colorful. Richard Photo Lab over at richardphotolab.com, upstrap at upstrap-pro.com, and of course, our media partners at the Analog Photography User Group over at www.apug.org. We'll be back next week with more great analog photography. 